Today, I am directing our House Committee to open a formal impeachment inquiry into President Joe Biden. I think it's been, frankly, long overdue. Should voters worry about the ages of President Biden and former President Donald Trump? I think that's an absolutely legitimate concern. And the presidency's not a job for someone that's 80 years old. Hello, I'm Nicole Killian in Washington, and welcome to America Decides. House Speaker Kevin McCarthy has announced he is directing multiple House committees to open an impeachment inquiry into President Biden. The speaker said allegations the president profited off of his son's business dealings are credible. This logical next step will give our committees the full power to gather all the facts and answers for the American public. That's exactly what we want to know, the answers. I believe the president would want to answer these questions and allegations as well. Conservative lawmakers have been calling on McCarthy to launch this. The White House is calling it extreme politics at its worst and say House Republicans haven't turned up any evidence of wrongdoing. But first, we begin with Speaker McCarthy's announcement of a Biden impeachment inquiry. Earlier, I spoke with Texas Republican Congressman Chip Roy. Congressman Chip Roy joins us now. Congressman, thanks so much for joining us. I first want to start off by getting your reaction to Speaker McCarthy's announcement today that he is directing an impeachment inquiry against President Biden. Do you think that's warranted and why now? Yeah, sure. I mean, I think it's been, frankly, long overdue. Uh, but, you know, we've had to allow the Oversight Committee and Judiciary Committee to go about doing their work. Uh, Jamie Comer and his staff have done a phenomenal job, frankly, without the backing of a Department of Justice using the tools at the disposal uh, that, of the Department of Justice that they have. And uh, we've been able to go uncover a whole lot of troubling facts. And I think the American people have seen that. Uh, my friend Dan Bishop was just talking about stuff that we've been looking at and uh, concerns about uh, FARA violations, uh, foreign corrupt practices violations. Uh, these are real concerns when we look at the money that's flown uh, or th flowed, sorry, from uh, foreign governments to the son of a vice president turned president. Uh, so I think we've got more than ample evidence uh, to look at that's troubling to go forward and, and pursue an impeachment inquiry. How do you counter the White House, though, which says after nine months of investigations, there is no evidence of wrongdoing? Yeah, I mean, that's what I would say if I were them, too, to try to avoid the actual problem. But the American people are looking at the facts, and they've got the same concerns that we have here as their representatives, uh, that there have been blatant violations, that this is potentially uh, the most corruption that we have seen at the highest levels of government in the White House in perhaps our history in terms of the dollars flowing to the family of a president. Uh, from foreign countries, uh, the clear conflicts of interest, looking at Burisma, looking at what we're seeing with respect to Ukraine and, and uh, Hunter's involvement there. Uh, these are m more than troubling. And, and, and to pursue an impeachment inquiry, just so everybody understands, is to elevate it to the level to be able to use the full tools at our disposal to go seek the truth. We've not been able to go dive into the bank accounts of any member of the Biden family. I suspect they don't want that to happen. Don't you? But even though you find some of this troubling, what specific evidence that do you have that rises to the level of an impeachable offense? Well, what we're talking about here is the flow of dollars from foreign governments through and to the son of the former vice president turned president. What we have is the fact that we had whistleblowers producing evidence directly contradicting the president, that he had no knowledge of all this, and that it wasn't connected to Hunter's uh, business associates. What we have is uh, testimony that we now learn, and we've seen the emails with the pseudonyms that we'd like to get a little bit more information on. But again, this is all without diving into the bank accounts and going into the information that we're going to need to see. And so I suspect that the president and Hunter have no desire for us to see where the dollars have flowed. That's what I think they're concerned about, and that's why I think we need an impeachment inquiry to go seek the truth. All we want to do is seek truth wherever it may lead. So since you are on the Judiciary Committee, which is one of the panels investigating, what more do you expect your committee to do with this new charge? Well, well, now we'll look between the Oversight Committee, which has been, of course, uh, leading the uh, investigation, coupled with the Judiciary Committee with respect to impeachment inquiry. Uh, we will now go look and take this up and pursue uh, what we need to to get subpoenas, to get the right information so that we can know the truth. That's it. I mean, look, I'm a former federal prosecutor. 
That's what you do. <laughs> once you've got some reasonable suspicion, once you've got some basis, you go pursue it. You go do investigations and you go figure out where the facts lead. And then you decide whether you've got something that's indictable and that you can then go prosecute. So that's all this is about. Again, if there's nothing to worry here, what are they afraid of? What are they afraid of? What is your timetable? Well, I think uh, given the, the news today that the speaker is directing an impeachment inquiry, I would expect that the committees would move uh, with, uh, you know, expedition uh, immediately this week to uh, pursue the, the facts wherever they may lead. On the House floor a short time ago, Florida Republican Congressman Matt Gates had this to say about the inquiry. Take a listen. Speaker McCarthy endorsed an impeachment inquiry. This is a baby step following weeks of pressure from House conservatives to do more. We must move faster. I know you're anxious to move forward, but do you agree with him? Well, I mean, clearly uh, the, the, the press and the Biden administration, the White House don't see it as just a baby step because they don't want people to see where the dollars have flown um, from foreign countries through Hunter to the president. You also mentioned the issue of government funding. I want to ask you about that as well. You just wrapped up a press conference with the House Freedom Caucus. You and several of your fellow caucus members have said that you will not support a continuing resolution, but clearly it doesn't seem plausible that either chamber is going to be able to move through all of the appropriations bills in time. Is it worth risking a government shutdown? Well, what our job, what our duty is as members of Congress is to stand athwart an executive branch enormously out of its lane and conducting itself in a tyrannical way, undermining the freedoms, liberties, and the well-being and the general welfare of the American people. That's our job. So if the president and if Chuck Schumer want to shut the government down, rather than funding the appropriate level of government at the appropriate spending level, doing what it's supposed to do, that's on them. Our job is to do the right thing. We weren't sent here to rubber stamp a continuing resolution at the 20, 23 spending levels at almost $1.7 trillion that is funded an out of control government, a weaponized Department of Justice, wide open borders that are harming directly the people that I represent in Texas, where people are dying. Little girls and little boys are dying. If I have to sit down next to another mom who loses a child from fentanyl poisoning, then that is something that would be on me if I fund that. That is why no Republican, particularly no Texas Republican, should vote to fund a government at war with the people of Texas. That is what this is about. Nothing more, nothing less. We have a voting card and we should use it. But where do you put the chances of a shutdown, given your position? Well, we will be there ready to fund an appropriate government uh, doing its constitutional duty at the right levels to not, uh, you know, basically uh, make our, our kids and grandkids subject to debt going forward for, you know, generation after generation. We're going to do our job. If they don't want to do their job, then they can own it. But that's the very important point here. If you vote for a continuing resolution, at 2023 levels, funding this weaponized government, this open borders, this woke Department of Defense, then you own it. You own every ounce of it. So our job is to change it. That's how you use the power of the purse. But I understand your position on funding levels, but whether you're talking about the continuing resolution or some of these appropriations bills, aren't you, and by you I mean House Republicans, going back on your word in terms of that debt limit deal that was secured this spring? And how do you well, justify that? Well, first of all, uh, the debt deal was about the debt. Uh, the fact is, that doesn't lock you in as to saying you need to spend at that level. Second of all, I didn't cut that deal. It was a deal that shouldn't have been cut. So what we're st standing up right now and saying is, do our job. Don't fund an out-of-control government. I mean, in all seriousness, like, in what world is it okay for me to vote to fund a government that is doing what they're doing to Texas right now? I know you say you understand my position. I've heard that from lots of people in the media. But we've got 7,000 people coming across the border yesterday. We've got 73,000 dead Americans from fentanyl poisoning. We had 856 migrants who died along the southern border last year. I've had numerous sessions with moms just over August who lost their children to fentanyl poisoning. How many little girls have to get sold in the sex trafficking trade? Why should I fund that? The answer is I shouldn't. That's why we were given the power of the purse by the founding fathers. We should stand up at this building against the other end of Pennsylvania Avenue and say, no, you don't get to do that. We have a voice here, and that's what this is about. It's not about arbitrary decisions about, oh, there's going to be a shutdown. This, this government shut down the biggest economy in the history of the world. 
They shut it down two years ago, killing jobs, putting our kids in the corners, forcing masks on them. And we're going to get worried about, oh, we might have the government shut down for a week or two. How about we do our job? fund our defense, fund our security, fund our sovereignty, and then get the hell out of the way of the American people so they can live. All right, Congressman Shiproy, thank you so much for joining us. Thanks, Nicole. Age concerns are a top issue among voters of both political parties. Up next, Ron DeSantis weighs in on that debate in an exclusive interview with CBS News. You're streaming America Decides. Welcome back to America Decides. Florida Governor Ron DeSantis hopes to be a younger alternative to former President Trump or President Biden. Today, he sat down for an interview with CBS Evening News anchor and managing editor Nora O'Donnell to discuss that and other issues. Here's part of their conversation. Age has become an issue in this presidential contest. Should voters worry about the ages of President Biden and former President Donald Trump? I think that's an absolutely legitimate concern. And the presidency's not a job for someone that's 80 years old, and there's nothing you know, wrong with being 80. Obviously, I'm the governor of Florida. I know a lot of people who are elderly. They're great people. But you're talking about a job where you need to give it 100 percent. Need, we need an energetic president. And I think that if the founders could, could kind of look at this again, I do think they probably would have put an age limit uh, on some of these offices. I mean, it seems like our leadership class now in Washington uh, 75, 80, 80 plus years old is, is where those folks are. And I think that, I think Americans, if we, if, if Biden's the Democrat nominee, I'm the Republican nominee, I think there's gonna be a lot of Americans that are gonna wanna see a generational passing of the torch. And we're joined now by CBS News political director, Finn Gomez. And Finn, just wanna get your take on the governor's comments. You know, it really struck me when he said the presidency is not a job for someone that's 80 years old. Kind of blunt there, I mean. How do you read his comments? And mentioning 75 as well. So I think that it's a two-for-one shot there. Two, uh, two, two, front, two front runners with one stone, if you will, I mean, going after both President Biden and the front runner uh, in the Republican GOP primary race. That's uh, former Republican uh, President Donald Trump. So I did. it did seem to me very similar to what we've been hearing from Nikki Haley, who's been on top of this issue, really raising criticism on this issue with her mental acuity test of 75 and older. To me, it was seemed very, very similar to what we've been hearing from Nikki Haley. I did talk to the to the Trump campaign to, to ask them what their response was to what uh, Ron DeSantis just said, uh, and their response was one word, and that was sad by, the, uh, by a senior official there. You know, I know we did some recent polling here at CBS News with respect to the issue of age where we found 77 percent of those surveyed favor age limits for elected officials compared to 23 percent who don't. I mean, so when someone like Ron DeSantis is making a comment like this, is this just kind of playing into the electorate or is this something that could potentially hurt him with senior voters who are a significant voting bloc. A huge voting bloc. I think something like the median age of the Republican voters, something about like mid-60s, somewhere around there. And also he's coming from Florida. He was very careful to mention that when he talked about uh, senior voters. Um, and, it, and it's also, uh, it just if you recall, uh, Nicole, back in July, the ARP had a, had a poll that came out that showed between older uh, voters, uh, a matchup between Biden and Trump was virtually tied. Uh, between DeSantis and Biden, hypothetically, he had about a six-point lead against Biden amongst those older voters. So he has to tread carefully there politically because, again, many of those voters fit that age uh, group. And I know you mentioned President Trump, but also with respect to President Biden, certainly the president and his team often say, you know, just watch him, look at what he's doing. But to sure. a certain extent, is his age an Achilles heel? Well, it has been, and it has been a, a big political target by Republicans. I mean, they have really focused on that. Uh, and so you've been hearing that, you've been seeing that. I did talk to one Democrat, one, one top-level Democrat yesterday, who, uh, talking specifically about that, and that he did mention to me that there was a little bit of a contrast between what you're seeing Biden just in his, in his how, he, how he acts sometimes. I think there was some criticism over his, his press conference in Vietnam. Uh, but it is interesting because if you look at if you look at Donald Trump, right, who is the who is the dominant frontrunner in the Republican Party right now, uh, he's only three years behind uh, Biden. Yet the it, it pretty much wavers. If you look at the Wall Street Journal poll that just came out this week, about 73 percent said that age was a factor for for Biden, but only about 40 
plus percent were saying that the same thing about Trump. So there is a little bit of a disparity. I think that part of that is because it has been such a target by Republicans. And then, uh, you know, in terms of another potential pitfall for the president, obviously we know that this impeachment inquiry was just launched today right. by uh, House Speaker Kevin McCarthy. But uh, we've talked a little bit uh, earlier in the show about how this might play politically on Capitol Hill. But what about on the campaign trail? What type of reaction are you hearing? Well, Nicole, I just spoke to a uh, senior level uh, Democrat from Biden world who say that Biden world feels confident that this political exercise, this political stunt referring to this impeachment inquiry is going to, quote, backfire on Republicans, both politically and electorally, is what they said. They're gearing up for a fight, and they think it's going to benefit them in the long run politically. I mean, is this just an effort, uh, what do you think, on the part of Republicans to weaken the president going into this election cycle? I think, I think many Democrats that I spoke to believe that, and I think that by doing so, you do open some distraction. But if you look, you know, former speaker, there's been former, uh, I, I spoke to some Republicans, former Republican congressmen actually just a couple of days ago, who said this could also backfire politically on Republicans on the Hill. So it's a, it's a little bit of, you know, tread carefully. Yeah, well, it's certainly going to be a very interesting campaign cycle as we proceed with yeah, just, what, 125 up, days left 125 days the until Iowa the caucuses. Iowa caucuses, Nicole. <laughs> so to be continued, Finn Gomez, thank you so much. Lawmakers on Capitol Hill are reacting to Speaker McCarthy's decision to green light an impeachment inquiry into President Biden. We will take a look at more of the political impact next. You're streaming America Decides. This is the extremist Republicans trying to figure out how they can use the business of the American people doing the work we're supposed to do as leverage to try to improve their political position. These extremists are here to do nothing more than get Donald Trump reelected. Welcome back to America Decides. That was Massachusetts Senator Elizabeth Warren reacting to Speaker McCarthy's decision to call for an impeachment inquiry into President Biden as the House returned today from their summer recess. Lawmakers have until the end of the month to pass spending bills that would keep the government funded. Ashley Etienne and Kevin Sheridan join us now. Ashley is a CBS News political contributor and the former communications director for Vice President Kamala Harris and former House Speaker Nancy Pelosi. And Kevin is a founding partner at Protean Public Affairs. He previously served as a spokesperson for the RNC and as a senior advisor to the Romney-Ryan 2012 presidential campaign. Uh, welcome to both of you. You know, I just want to start off because we just got some additional uh, reaction from Capitol Hill from some congressional Democrats. Uh, let's take a listen to that sound and we'll get your reaction on the other side. We were sent to Washington, D.C. to improve the quality of life of everyday Americans. The extreme MAGA Republicans are determined to illegitimately investigate the president as part of an ideological crusade that week after week after week continues to do nothing more than try and jam their extreme right wing ideology down the throats of the American people. We also heard from leader Chuck Schumer earlier today, who basically said that, you know, the speaker needs to kind of rein in his members who have gone off the deep end in his view. But Ashley, I just want to start by getting your reaction to congressional Democrats and how you think this impeachment inquiry will play for them on the other side. Well, you know, I ran the four, first war room, impeachment war room for Speaker Pelosi. And the difference then and the difference now is that there was actually evidence there. There is no evidence here. So for me, I think the American people will see this for what it actually is. It's the Republican House trying to settle a score for Donald Trump. But they're also it's an attempt for McCarthy to keep his job. So but here's the thing. You can't. You know, impeachment should be so serious that it should be a very last resort. I watched Speaker Pelosi take the pressure and succumb to pressure, not succumb to with, withstand pressure from her own caucus for over a year to not move forward on impeachment without any evidence. She refused to move forward until the president actually gave us the evidence. He gave us the tape 
with his phone call to Zelensky asking for dirt on Donald Trump. We saw a video of him standing on the ellipse telling an angry mob of insurrectionists to go down to the Capitol and fight like hell. So there was evidence there. There is no evidence here. And I think that the Republican Party should back off of it and realize that this is a loser every time. I mean, Kevin, I see you smiling there. Obviously, we know House Republicans have been investigating for a number of months now. Is there a there there? Well, there may not be bank record evidence yet, but that's because the IRS was not allowed to investigate that. We'll now give them subpoena power to uh, potentially look at the you know, 12 or so banks that, you know, and, and that flagged uh, suspicious transactions. And, and what was the $20 million flowing through, you know, Joe Biden's grandkids' LLCs? That, you know, there is a lot of circumstantial evidence. Uh, we'll see if they can, you know, find the fire. But there is smoke. But here's the thing. Republicans always jump the shark. They always put their desire ahead of the facts, their desire, their, their politics of retribution before the facts. And they're doing it here again. The reality is you could get those bank records without initiating an, a, an inquiry at all. You don't have to have an inquiry to get that The IRS that whistleblowers said they were blocked and they were not able to get them. By the Trump administration. By, so here's the by thing. By the DOJ, by, by right. career people at the DOJ, to be who, clear. Who were appointed by Donald Trump. Oh. But here's the thing. To your point, Nicole, the Republicans had five years to investigate. They've been investigating Hunter Biden for five years, two DOJs, five years. And all they came up with was a gun charge and tax evasion and no connection to the president. So how much more of the American taxpayer dollars are we going to continue to throw behind these false allegations with the hopes that, you know, the Republicans can find something that they can hold against? I mean, to both of you, what do you make of Speaker Kevin McCarthy not holding a vote or seeming to not intend to hold a vote on the House floor with respect to this impeachment inquiry? Well, He's getting pressure from his uh, from the Freedom Caucus. They were set to meet today, and um, clearly they want to move forward. They think there's enough there. Why he didn't hold a vote? I think you know because he doesn't have the votes. <laughs> I'll answer the question for you, Kevin. Because he doesn't have the votes. I mean, the reality but regardless is, regardless of whether he does or not, sure. should he be holding that vote? Oh, absolutely. Period? I mean, absolutely. Is this changing the rules. Well, there's going to be a lot of hypocrisy on both sides right now. Of everybody who who loved impeachments uh, for four years is now now against impeachments, and everybody who. Wanted full votes on the floor last time. You know, we're going to be hypocritical this time. But look, we'll see what they, they turn up. They have turned up a lot so far. We'll see what else comes out. Can I just quote Republican on the House side? They're asking the same question. Where is the evidence? When your caucus is asking where is the evidence, maybe you shouldn't move forward. And that's exactly why he didn't have a vote. Obviously, this is all coming at a very busy time for Capitol Hill. As we mentioned, you know, there's also this issue of trying to fund the government. How could this impeachment inquiry potentially complicate those efforts, which you know, we know Congress only has about 11 legislative days left this month? Yeah, and they're going to have to say, if you want to continue this impeachment, you got to keep the government open. I think that's what some of the leadership is going to play that game a little bit. Uh, we'll see if that flies with the Freedom Caucus. But yeah, it's another tough, uh, another tough spending I mean, situation. it's a sad state of affairs when you have the speaker who's negotiating with his caucus and saying, I'll give you impeachment if you give me the opportunity to keep the government open. I mean, that's a sad state of affairs for our, our political um, leadership Kevin, and uh, in the, the atmosphere on the Hill. It's, I mean, it's, it's sad. And regrettably, the American people always suffers the consequence of it all. Well, it is a conversation that is to be continued. And we thank you both, Ashley and Kevin, for joining us. And that does it for today. You are watching and streaming CBS News.